not sure. Anyway, you get me. So right now, though, we've got Lara Noble. And Lara Noble is going to talk to us a lot about how to design and construct a tiny house. But something you may not know is that Lara is widely considered one of the early pioneers of tiny houses on wheels in Queensland. So, Lara, you might tell us this, but when did you first get involved with the tiny house on wheels thing? Do you, want to, do you want to hold it or do you want me to put it on there? Uh, I can hold it. Okay. I've got two things to hold. Just don't talk into the other thing. And if I need a drink, I'll just figure oh, something out. If you out. need a drink, <laughs> we are gone. <laughs> um, three and a bit years ago. Three and a bit years ago. I think it's over three now, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Three, and so three and a half, four. Lara's done a, completed a Masters in Architecture. Yeah, I actually got registered, so I'm an architect. I've been registered too, but probably in another way. <laughs> <laughs> registered in. <laughs> I, I was actually registered as a national treasure. <laughs> as a national treasure. <laughs> it's not really. Maybe. I can't um, compete. But then, being a good architect, you realise you couldn't just build things with sky hooks. So you actually went and became a carpenter. Yes. So how good is that? So will you please welcome Lara Noble as she tells us about how to design and construct a tiny house. G'day everyone. I can't really see you, but you can see me because of the lights, I guess. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you about how to design and construct a tiny house. Um, I'm, I've got lots of points, lots of sort of dot points and ideas. So I'm going to be moving through them pretty quickly. Um, but afterwards, there's a discussion panel. So if you've got any questions, maybe, or you can hit me up after. Um, so, quick introduction is my partner Andrew and I um, did architecture and I guess we're, we're architects and we teamed up with the guy I did my apprenticeship with, Greg, who's a builder, um, an exper experienced builder and um, if it moves, yeah, um, oh gosh, it's too fast. Um, <laughs> And I'm a carpenter, and we've already said this, but it's part of my slides, so I have to say something. Um, <laughs> so I'm also a carpenter, so I've got that construction background a bit now too. Um, so it's a four-year apprenticeship, and then I've been working as a carpenter for a couple of years. Um, and so I guess the design build stuff is, it makes sense to be, for me to be talking about that. And we've built um, quite a few tiny houses. We built one three and, three and a bit years ago, I think now. Um, that was the one you might have heard about in one of the earlier sessions um, that we parked at Red Hill and is, is still there. And Ricky and Valerie have been kind of part of the team on the planning side of things from ESC Consulting and their legends. Um, so they're sort of part of the early stuff that was being going on four years ago or whatever in Brisbane on tiny houses on wheels. So, um, so this is some of the things I've learned, and I guess it's aimed at people who are interested in the idea of designing and building their own tiny house or one for someone else. Um, so back then, before we built our first tiny house, we um, were invited over to a conference in Portland, a similar thing to this, maybe a larger scale, um, quite a lot more people because the tiny house movement was a bit more established over there. Um, oh, you can see some of the tiny houses parked in the car park and that's only some of them. There was like about two rows or something. And there was talks all day. Um, so I guess at that we were doing our homework, trying to find out what we could about what was happening in America at the time, how to build a tiny house, what are the things we need to watch out for. The reality is that when we came back to Australia, we had to pretty much start from scratch because it's a different story here. The whole RV industry and the way things are set up and the rules and regulations in America are different. So um, what, one of the first points I wrote is do your homework, do research, um, but also know the context to which you are working within. So um, while there's some terrific um, uh, videos and tutorials and information packages that are based on the American tiny houses that don't necessarily apply here or are suitable. So cross-reference that with what we know about the situation here. Um, so that's my first tip. Do your homework. 
if you want to embark on building a tiny house. It is actually a house that you're building. Even It's also a, a car, like a trailer. It's also a vehicle that needs to be on the road. So it has to meet not just the rules and regulations that a house must meet, but also that those which the transport department require for it to be towed. So it's not a small undertaking, even though by area it is. Um, so one of the things I'm going to bring in from our, how long do we do architecture for? Five years at uni plus a year in between is like, say 12 years combined architecture. Um, just a little bit of that has slipped its way into this slideshow. Um, that on top of all the, the pragmatics, you're also building a home, a house, somewhere to live. And so you need to combine the pragmatic issues with some poetics. And I think that's, um, I think that's what I put those, a caravan and a tiny house. Not that there's anything wrong with a caravan. Um, and you can live in a caravan. And a lot of people do. And you can live in a caravan for a long time. But it has a, a very different design um, basis to a tiny house. And that's what you have to define early on in your project, what the brief, as an architect would say, is. What is the brief? How often are you moving it? And, and bear in mind that um, the combination of those two things. So where our project could be driven purely by pragmatics, um, you're going to get a different outcome to something that you're trying to turn into a home. Um, <coughs> Here's some of the constraints uh, as a quick overview. There's a bit, bit to it, but um, a tiny house on wheels here, around about eight metres, 7.2, 7.5, eight-ish. When you start going over eight, you start um, uh, hitting a lot of extra barriers in terms of weight, in terms of manoeuvrability. Um, so you're restricted to two and a half metres wide. That's the outermost point to the outermost point. Like, a door handle or a bit of flashing or anything. Um, and that's so that you can get it road registered and tow it at any point in time. There, you can have wider load things, but they uh, fall under a different category um, when you go to tow it on the road. Um, the total height from the road is 4.3. If you are planning to build a tiny house, I'd recommend aiming for 4.2, you know, 100 mil. You know, you don't want it to be too tall because it's about getting around the roads and um, uh, and about four ton is the weight. So your trailer might be about a ton. So you got about three ton to play with. And yeah, and budget budgets are constraint. There's heaps of other constraints, but these are just some of the ones that I've pulled out. Um, so there's our first tiny house um, on one of its early trips. It's been moved around a fair bit. Um, this is it getting, this is why those constraints matter when you're moving it around. Um, yeah, you want it to fit underneath cables and bridges and um, this was a bit of a tricky one to get it into. Um, uh, in Red Hill, slopey streets. Um, you also need to consider very early on um, the context. So ask yourself these questions. Um, how often are you going to move this? Because that will determine how, what materials you're going to use. You know, the caravan will turn out very different to a tiny house. Who's going to build it? Be realistic about your skills and um, your capacity. I'm not saying don't take it on, um, but that might affect how you design it, um, uh, what your personal living preferences are. Like, do you, are you happy to climb up a ladder? Do you not want to climb up a ladder? Will it be off grid? Where are you going to park it? What are the climatic conditions? Like, do you need to insulate it more? Do you need double glazing? So on and so forth. Do you have a site or do you not have a site? And if you don't have a site, what, how much do you want to um, design for any kind of site? So, like. I don't know if you know much about soil orientation, but you might have an intention to be able to orientate your house a certain way so that you can maximise the way that it performs in those conditions. Um, 
So be conscious of your context when you're researching and designing. Understand how these factors will influence the final outcome of your design. Um, and keep them in mind. It might, it might be worth the time to actually write yourself a brief if you're designing a tiny house. This was the first one that we designed. At, um, and we parked it in a few places and then we took it to Woodford. Um, and this is a, a, the same type, built for an off-grid bush location. This is it at um, Red Hill, where some really good friends of ours have bought it and are living in it. Um, and there's my little head poking up. Um, you, probably this photo gets shared around heaps and Andrew and I always have a cackle because there's like me just poking my head up there. And it's like, for some reason, it's the photo that <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, we should Photoshop that out, but we actually quite like it. Um, <laughs> um, this is a, the, the tiny house on the road to the bush block. So, the next point I wanted to make was um, when you're designing, the way you do think about a tiny house or the way we approach the project was to think about consol consolidating spaces. So, instead of thinking about, well, where's my bedroom going to be in this tiny house or where's my, you know, it, it's more about thinking about the activities that you're going to do in the space. So, try and like, get the idea of a room out of your head. And so this diagram that Andrew did is showing you the spaces that you are high usage in a house. So this is like a three bed house. Um, and you, you highly use the bed. You highly use this space where you might be sitting and hanging and chatting and watching something or, um, and the kitchen spaces are high use. So the point um, we're trying to make is that all of a tiny house is high use. And so the, your activities have to overlap. So you, the more sort of dividers you put in the space, the more you're going to cut off other things like airflow and um, views and so on. Um, so um, what's this photo about? Um, you need to be able to adapt the space. So this is a lounge room, but it's also a bedroom, if you want to call it a room. I just said don't use the word room. Okay, take that back. It's a lounge and it's a bed. And there's multiple ways you can do that. This one hoists down from the ceiling. Um, uh, you can see that it's also an open space that's also part of the kitchen. Um, it's... It's also adapted to, so the lounge can adapt to be a coffee table and there's a fold down table. So you can open and close the space. And Andrew and I believed when we were writing the brief for ourselves that you don't want to, the difference between a caravan and a home is that a caravan, everything has to go exactly where it's like sculpted for. Like there's, can be even like a, a little nook in the, in the shower where your soap goes, like your toilet paper roll can only fit in two spaces in the tall house. Like it's very restricted by nature of the fact that it's on the road and it has to be light. But we realise that a home needs to be able to absorb some of who you are. So you need somewhere to be able to hang a picture. You need to be able to bring a bit of yourself into the space. So we set that challenge for ourselves that the space could also not be so restrictive that you can't adapt it. And these photos a photographer took of the same unit and how people have made the space their own. Um, and so that's how you can think of your tiny house if that's a, something that you would desire. Um, another tip for designing a tiny house, this is like quick, quick fire tips. Um, steal extra space. So look around and think in 3D about where you might be able to grab a little, a little bit of extra room. So we've, um, in the bathroom, we're able to um, eat into the wall a bit um, to make some shelves. Um, we used the height that we were allowed to stow away the bed um, and this kind of thing. Um, try and allow for plenty of storage because even though you're wanting to live in a tiny house and you're going to have to downsize you also want some stuff and you want to be an interesting person and you want hobbies and 
you might be into, like, you need places to store stuff. Um, and so factor in plenty of good storage and a variety of it. So some open shells, some tucked away, some hard to access, some really easy to access, and so on. Um, so this is a diagram showing how we think that it's important, in a, especially in a tiny space, to think about views. Um, because you don't want to feel boxed in, um, even though you are literally in a box that's very like, designated how big it can be. Um, you want to be able to feel that it's bigger than it is, right? That's the ultimate aim of good design in a tiny house, I'd say. Um, and views and windows and light, it's not necessarily about making a glass box because that's not a good thing either, but being very strategic about how you position um, and what each window is doing, um, window or door. So, so, for example, this photo is showing how we wanted to achieve long views down through the house. So you sit on the couch on one end and you can see right through down the other side. Um, and that's a good thing because it gives you a sense of space. However, if it was the only view, then you'd feel like you're in a train carriage. So you also want cross views. So this is a photo looking through the house. So you can see right through it. Um, and the high windows, you can't see out of them, but they're important for ventilation and light. So the heat comes up and is able to be sucked out the top because heat rises. Um, so there's some of the, um, also mirrors can be handy in uh, providing an extra, extra light and views without having to install a window. So they're kind of like a cheat way of getting like a two thirds of a window if that makes sense. You get the view and the lights sometimes, if they're well positioned. Poorly positioned, they can just be annoying because you're just looking at yourself all the time. Um, <laughs> so it seems like uh, we've, like the, the smaller the space, the more you've got to like, um, kind of uh, think about the design. Um, the, the trickier it is because the more things are interacting with each other at the same time. Um, so this is another photo showing the views through the house um, and how that can be really nice. And then you can potentially, you can um, organise what you're looking at out the other side. If you have a nice site, you could plant a garden or, um, and arrange that views. And you can do that still within a fairly small space around the house as well. Um, so, oh, a little bit more architecture has like sucked its way in. Um, the poetics of the space, it's, it's kind of a whole lecture in itself in a way, but um, there's various different designs of tiny houses where you can, you can see when the space is working together. And um, some of the kind of the ideas behind some of our earlier um, and what ended up our designs is to like be able to come into a, a high, um, a high space. So the ceiling heights and the materiality um, affect how you feel in a space as well. So um, I guess this is just trying to talk about that and also how you might organise the space with the structure. So we used a grid structure um, that runs through and connects the deck into the main house and it wraps around um, and helps to organise the space visually, I guess, and structurally. So you can see how that's played out in this um, 900 grid spacing. Um, and that's played out in the posts that run up between the windows and also how the modular deck built, is built together and into the cabinetry and so on and so forth. So it means that when you come up onto the deck, you already sort of feel what this space is going to be like and the scale of it. Um, it sounds a bit wanky. <laughs> but it has a lot of effects into how a small space might work and it even um, played out into having like a small window and a small door and then a larger and a larger. Um, and that meant that we could fold them back and create quite a nice opening while still keeping strictly within our grid. Um, that kind of also shows it a little bit with the joists there. <sighs> Mm 
these are some views of this. I'm mostly going through this early design, or even though, oh my goodness, okay. Um, that's a five minute warning. All right, so design tips. I'm just gonna fly through these. When you're designing, you need to cycle through different scales. You can't be designing at the one scale. So the details are really important. Um, how small things go together and how it is on the, on the scheme of like a town planning situation. What is it like in various different contexts in the city or out in the bush? Um, you need to get lots of critique from lots of different people. Ask everyone to comment and take on board their comments, even the good ones and the bad ones and everything. And role play different scenarios. Um, so what, how much space do you need to do various things? And now I'm gonna do a quick smash course in building a tiny house. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you start with a trailer and then you put a floor down and then you start framing um, and you brace it. So you've had an engineer already look at your designs and tell you when you need to brace it and tie it down. Um, you build this, the framing and the structure and brace it and you wrap it in building paper, which helps insulate it and waterproof it. Uh, it's like the layer behind the cladding. Um, and then you can start cladding it and that's like the early stage. I have a video that you can watch um, on our website. Um, one of the, a couple of the points that I wanted to say for how to build a tiny house um, is managing the build is really important having good documentation, so good sets of drawings to explain your ideas. To It won't just be you, there'll be other people. Even if it's just your brother painting, you need to explain where he should paint. Um, you need to take in, to effect, into account lead times for various things. Um, windows and doors and, and items take time to prepare. So scheduling and organising your build is very important. Um, build on a level, stable ground. The first tiny house we built, we built on gravel and every morning we would have to level our house up so that we could plumb walls and straighten things and it's a big waste of time and it's very frustrating. Don't do that. Um, having things plumb and square is very important. If you haven't built houses, if you're not into construction, don't underestimate how important this is. If I had more time, I would talk about it for a long time but I don't, but get things plumb, that means upright and square. Um, don't build wonky walls. Um, coordinating the trades is a little trickier in a tiny house because you end up working over the top of each other, so you have your plumber under you and your electrician above you and you're trying to put a window in. It's kind of uncomfortable, so coordinating who's coming when and how to do that, a little bit more challenging. Um, Build your tiny house so that it meets the National Construction Code um, and the Vehicle Standards Bulletin and use the Australian Standards. So if you don't know any of those documents, find out what they are and understand how your building will fit in with them. Just meet those codes, they're important. Um, they ensure that you're, you're building something that is safe and well built and that you're not going to regret because it leaks or whatever. Um, Get people to check things, get certification for things, document things very well, take lots of photos. Um, oh, this is one Andrew threw in. Um, put blocking in the walls, put extra blocking in um, so that you can fix things in the walls. Like, I, th I don't know, it's kind of irrelevant considering my time frame, but it was a good point, Andrew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Like, if you want to put a toilet roll holder on, for example, and you don't have any blocking, you've got nothing to screw to, it's really annoying. Um, get your watershed correct. So understand how water travels over flashing and windows. And if you don't, get a roofer, make friends with a roofer, take him for a beer, work out where and how your water might get into your place and use proper flashing. Um, it's not always as simple as it seems. Usually it is. If you have a very straight, simple roof, then it's not a problem. But if you're doing tricky stuff, make sure you try and get it right. Um, uh, understand that there'll be flex in the frame, especially over large spans, um, and deflection in the trailer, and how that might affect your design. So that's kind of from an early stage engineering point of view. Um, keep track of your weight as you're building. So. Don't let, um, don't let that get, get away from you. 
too much. Like, know what you're putting in, um, how heavy your trailer is becoming. Um, I would recommend definitely getting uh, some engineering because it's dif difficult to do that after getting an engineer to check and look at your work. Um, there's so much to construction. Um, I've just flown through this stuff. But doc documents that you should look at um, and understand the, the national construction, well, parts of, th those that apply the National Construction Code um, and the Vehicle Standards Bulletin, which will tell you how, how to, to be able to build something that can get registered, because ultimately that's the aim when you finish. You want to get a number plate for it and you want to be able to tow it around, right? Um, well, that's my next one. Oh, here's just a photo of it. Um, I haven't put up the other photos of, we've done a handful since we did three that went down to Tassie with totally different design. Um, that's another thing of like understanding the climatic conditions, all double glazed windows, totally different design, trying to collect as much northern light as possible to warm up well insulated floor. Um, so they're totally different design. This is the first one that we did. Then we did this other build, um, Swallowtail, which is a nice kind of butterfly roof one. Um, and we've done a few custom variations on that and a few others. Um, but the, okay. Um, thanks very much and sorry I talked too much on design. Um, <laughs> it was meant to be half half, but. Lara, you talk a lot because you have a lot to say. Thanks. <laughs> Which is more than me. I generally have not much to say, but I still talk a lot. Hey, thanks, Lara, too, for My just pleasure. sharing so much insight. <laughs> Lara is actually going to stick around. We're going to have a panel. So we're going to get set up with that, and we're going to play a video while we do that just to keep you entertained. But La this is the other thing is at 2 o'clock up in the mezzanine floor, uh, there's Paul Brandenburg and Jeremy Harkins from Bespoke Habitats who are going to be talking about how to build tiny or tiny and modular building. So if that will be the last um, talk up in the mezzanine floor today. So that starts at 2 p.m. It's quarter to 2 now. So you give us a few minutes, watch a video, we're going to set up, and then there's going to be a panel on the exact topic that Lara just spoke about. Thank you.